Hi, I'm Sarah Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Haley. I do promotion and I play some characters. Awesome. Hi, I'm Nathara. Um, I'm playing Reculus. Yeah, I'm just generally helping out. I should also say, I'm also narrating, like, the non acting bits, <laughs> which I don't know how much people on the server actually have noticed that. Wait, are you, like, you're the narrator in the... Yeah. Okay, I, listen, you do such a good job. Thank you. I, I, I am obsessed. <laughs> I love that, like, I was, I was literally gonna say, like, whoever had to do, I mean, first of all, like, there's so much, like, description and, like, stuff lot. that you have to, there's so many words, <laughs> um, but, like, your inflection, like, it's, it was so good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I've spent a lot of time on that stuff, but I have gone to acting school as well, so. Yeah, it helps. <laughs> but anyway, we've got a few questions for you. I think we can start a little bit broader, um, just, like, with the project and the story. Um, so, um, I think I'll start with, um, so when, when Sarah Lena asked you about, like, producing a pod fic, do you, like, were you surprised at all? Like, what was sort of your reaction to that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, because I have, I had never heard of pod fix before. Um, so, and, and it just seems like such a massive story that the idea of, like, taking it on in any capacity seemed, like, I was like, I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I can't conceptualize the organizational abilities that that would require. Um, so yeah, like I, I definitely did not foresee anybody ever wanting to, to, to do anything with this. So I was surprised, but I always think like, you know, like fandom is a space for creators and where we're supposed to bounce off of each other. So most of the time, like any time someone's like, hey, can I do this with the story or do that? Like, I'm more than happy to, you know, have us all collaborate. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's interesting because what I aim to do with this hasn't been done before with Podfix that I know of. Um, and Podfix traditionally were just audiobooks of fan fictions. I don't know why they didn't called audio fix. They've been called Podfix for as long as I've known about them. Um, but... Yeah, I was just like, well, I don't want to read 600,000 words on my own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I had done the math on it, and I was like, it would be so much easier to split this up. And there was a lot of consideration for a minute about um, if the characters themselves would be narrating their chapters. And then that got kiboshed pretty early on just due to the sheer amount of time it would take me to then supervise that. And also the editing time to make the voices internally sound different than the ones externally. Yeah. For where we are right now in post-production, I could not imagine making sure everybody knew what the difference was just on the mixing standpoint. Yeah. And I will say just something that I noticed um, from like comments on, on the social media and stuff is um, there's people that have um, like dyslexia or other type of like reading disabilities that thought it was, or that feel that it's um, super beneficial and super helpful to have um, sort of a different medium to enjoy these stories. So I think that's really cool as well, sort of an accessibility aspect to it. Yeah, well, and it's interesting, like always, I think, to see the way that stories change depending on how they're being told. Like, you know, we're, we're used to, to seeing that transition between like text and like film, for instance, but it's the, it's the same thing. Like the story is not gonna be exactly the same experience or exactly the same story audio -ly? audio, auditory, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. there we go. <laughs> That's with the ears. <laughs> as it is when you read it it's gonna it's gonna change and like i think that's very interesting as well yeah um whoa sorry i just messed up my tabs uh, <laughs> um yeah so i guess um we have a little bit of second second part to this question um so with the like scale of the project like were you at all surprised with the fact that we were going to do a full cast and like bring a bunch of people onto this um, yes, <laughs> still, like, still surprised, because, I mean, the story just gets, like, bigger and bigger, like, there's so many, there's so many people, and there's so many words that, um, that, yeah, uh, I, 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 I do understand, like, the, the, doing it as a, a pod fic does 
feel more doable to me than like if someone was like I'm gonna make a fan film I'd be like H how do you, have <laughs> <laughs> do you have millions of dollars like I don't know um so like I think it it seems like more feasible to me but again like I said like the organizational power that that you guys have I am in awe of because I I could not um there's certainly a lot even just between the main cast of the main eight um <laughs> two of them are English most of them are spread across the U.S. and then this one's all the way fucking on the I'm in Australia <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one on the other side of the world oh right now. <laughs> um well and I also think that like editing takes like years <laughs> like it takes so long and i don't think if if you have never edited something before like like you don't quite appreciate like how how difficult that can be like how much work that is even like simple things you're like it's fine it's just like someone's just gonna read a sentence it's never fine <laughs> it's never <laughs> simple <laughs> like i'm with all of the episode stuff like i have we have a team of editors and a team of mixers and the mixers each took a chapter for this first chunk, and they've done that with the second chunk as well, because I've broken it up into 30,000 words each time, so we had about three hours-ish worth of recording to do every single week, just to try to make it manageable. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than that, um, so <laughs> something. But in terms of like breaking it up, once they had done the mixing, I was the one who went through and like finalized everything and moved things and like actually added um, music and the different layers and um, spacing between text that wasn't necessarily there or sometimes people did too much spacing between text so even that layer of like someone's already gone through and organized this and then you go through and you reorganize it again to make sure it's just how I want it to be was quite the quite the thing I will say <laughs> much easier than me doing it all myself but it'll be interesting yeah. to see how long post-production takes from what I originally estimated to what actually ends up happening. Because originally, this first episode was supposed to be posted in the middle of August. And we just kept being like, let's let's just keep giving people more space to like figure it out. Um, and with a voluntary project like this, I've had... There's a running joke about how much I side-eye the sound crew for how many of them have like revolving doored out of... Sound crew is just like finding sound effects too. And like ambiance. And there's so many of them that have like come and then they're gone and I never hear yeah. from them again. Um, yeah. And then there's like two that have done things consistently. Or then there's people like Nathara who helped out once and created most of the sounds. <laughs> I do think that it's like fan, like all, all, all fan created stuff. Like we, we do it with obviously limited resources and like, time and all of that but like we also like for some reason the process is like way faster like like anything that's professionally done like all of this stuff the like editing the post-production like that takes just as long or if not longer than you know like movies are edited for years after their or like a year after they're shot or like even fan fiction like you know like i wrote choices that's like three novels in a year like most that's not how writers write books like it's, it's interesting, like, this, like, the way that we produce things, I don't know. Yeah, most writers don't. Some writers are Stephen King, um, and they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. That's what, that's what I always thought with Cassandra Clare, if she writes, like, the Shadowhunters books. And I was always like, I, like, she would release, like, three novels in a year. And I'd be like, how does she do that? And then I found out that, um she's a fan fiction writer and I went oh that makes sense yeah <laughs> yeah I was like oh yeah okay cool <laughs> um yeah so I guess we'll um scooch on over to our next question um so you have listened to episode one um so what are your thoughts on there are there any like specific moments that that stood out to you in that first episode which by the way uh, so as you answer this question these two have not heard it what so oh my god <laughs> <laughs> I feel so special. The Discord, um, people got individual episodes. Captioners each got an, a single episode. Nobody got more access than I was giving them so that the main audience is going to be the Discord. It is oh. about 200 people in there. So they're the main people who get to have to wait to actually go and watch it. Yeah, we got to yeah. hear for our audios, like, um, we got to do a little promo for the TikTok, like a very short audio, which yeah, was yeah. like, you know, about a minute long. And that's all each of us have ever have actually heard of our own audio and recording and it oh all put God. together. So we're all really eagerly waiting. Oh my God. 
So your feedback is um, going to be the first they even hear about some of the things I've done. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Now there's so much more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're literally like, yeah, so tell us. What, what is it? Okay. Um. So, like, I'll say that, like, I... So, <laughs> the best way to... Uh, you you were like, oh, it's three hours long. Like, I can have it to you with the visuals on Friday. But, like, if you think you'll need more time, like, I'll send it to you before. And I was like, send it to me before because I, I didn't know how long it was going to take me to get through it. And, like, I started listening to it. I don't know if you sent it to me on Thursday, but I started listening to it on Thursday. I, like, I didn't stop. Like, I just listened to three hours nonstop. I, like, lay in my bed with my little, like, blankets. And I just, like, it was, like, one in the morning. And I was like... I, I, and then yesterday I listened to it again. So, like, um, yeah, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's really good. I think, um, I think there's a lot of it that, like, a lot of the, like, the sound mixing is, is, is really well done. Um, you know, the characters are, are all really good. The chemistry is really good. I, I was telling you before, I think the narration was, like, on point. Um, um, parts that stood out to me. I, I noticed the, like, the Quidditch, the Quidditch scene. Gosh, what chapter is that? Chapter four, where, like, Regulus, where, like, James has his crisis, <laughs> and Regulus is flirting with people and winning sports. Um, that scene stood out to me because it was, like, it felt really vivid. Like, I think I had to, like, take a break to, like, I don't know, go get water or something. And when I came back, I had one of those moments where it was, like, I forgot that I wasn't, like, watching something on my laptop, that I was just, like, listening to it because I had been, like, so, um, I don't know, immersed in the in the moment. Um, so that one was really good. I really liked the first scene um, or the first, like, real back and forth between James and Regulus. Um after James rescues him from from Malthaver and Avery and Snape. That was like, there was like some really good, like, like the vibes were correct. <laughs> um, um, and the rhythm was like really good, the back and forth between the two of them. I like, I really enjoyed that. Definitely one of those moments where I was like doing the little happy, <laughs> the little happy squirms. <laughs> um, this is a this is an audio medium. <laughs> I've got to describe my movements. Um, um, I think also there is like there's the moment where in chapter two, um, uh, they're in the hospital wing after the the transformation, and Remus is freaking out, and there's that moment where Sirius like does the breathing with him hearing that was like very like that moment is really like it's like really something <laughs> but like for me like especially like I just like hearing that acted out like I don't know I was crying like I was just like uh like that that definitely really Somebody called that in the moment when we were doing that with, so Sirius's name is Anthony. Um, when we were doing that with Anthony, people are like, people are going to want just this audio on TikTok. <laughs> and I was like, really? But yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so the interesting part about our love of the first episode is um, just how many times our main actors had to redo it. <laughs> His audio has um, gotten fucked up three times. So... And then, like, certain spots have been messed up. So there are certain spots of the first episode that Mick or James has had to do five times. <laughs> and we Poor dude. slowly descended into madness of how many times <laughs> we'd done it, which was really funny after the first three times. But then after a while, it was like... Um, but yeah, he has, like, birds... The audio equipment was fighting against him. Oh, no. Discord is making noises in the background. People would like come in. Audio is the worst. Like it is the hardest thing to control for. Like even just doing the podcast, the first episode of the podcast we recorded three times because of like similar stuff. Like there would be beeping or like whatever, like, and you're like, stop. <laughs> like, why is this so hard? Why is it not working? <laughs> why is it not working? <laughs> 
It should be simple. <laughs> yeah. And then to make things even funnier, we had a tech person come in two weeks ago who knew how to fix all of that. And we never would have needed to re-record if he had only appeared sooner. <laughs> From the <sun. laughs> We were like, oh, oh, that hurts. Um, but yeah, uh, my question to follow that up is, how did you feel about the music moments in the episode? Those are probably the, my biggest kept secret right now is the music that I put in. So that'd be specifically like the last... Beginning and the, the end. Last... And then there's um, one, right? one underscore in the middle, oh, yeah. I believe. Would you like to describe that more in depth for me? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please. You will get that tomorrow. I... I really liked, I really liked the one, like, sort of, if, so, I, again, I don't know how secretive we're being also, but, oh, like. Oh, I mean, feel free the, to talk about it. I think they'll just be confused either way. The musical moments that bookend the, f the fifth chapter, so, like, the beginning, I don't know why that's stared out to me, but the beginning of where they're, um, James and Regulus are in the, the astronomy tower. Oh, the montage. Like the montage. That's top of I know. four, I think, technically? Because then they kiss at the end of four. Oh, yeah, you're right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it all meshes. But for some reason, that stood out to me. I liked the music also that's at the very end of the chapter. That moment was really nice. Um, the intro threw me off for a second, and then I like, and now I really like it. I got, I got I that. Got the intro was a uh, choice to place things more into the 70s and do something a little bit different, more experimental, and also not yeah. be as obviously like, this is going to be horribly sad by the time we're done, but <laughs> it will be something we can call back to. These two are dying because we're not talking about it enough, which is even funnier, but um, it will be able to call back to in a more painful way. I don't know how much you know about uh, supernatural side of fan fiction, but there's a very infamous fan fiction called Twist and Shout that has no, no, you can't. permanently ruined yes. a certain Elvis song for large factions of the fandom. Like you're unable to like listen to it and not cry. Uh, and like I'm not gonna lie and say that wasn't the goal, but that is eventually the goal with some of these songs. Sir, that is evil. <laughs> that is rude. <laughs> Um, and the end one, I really appreciate the end one. The end one was uh, an impromptu band that has been created to actually make that cover at the end. That was manufactured entirely by us as like a side project. Cute. <laughs> it was cute. <laughs> I think I literally shouted that at the end when it ended. I was like, that was cute as shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bob was like, what's happening? <laughs> Cuteness. And then from here on out, it's sad. I know. I was like, this is the end. What if it just ended here? What if it just ended? Whole... Everyone's happy. That's it. This is the whole fanfic. We're done. <laughs> if people really just want the happy vibes, just first episode never. <laughs> Don't watch the other 19. It's like, it's like stopping it's watching Titanic before the boat sinks. <laughs> like, Jack and Rose get together and it's just a, it's a rom-com on a cruise ship. That's it. That's, that's, that's the story. That's choices. A rom com on a cruise ship. <laughs> a rom com on a cruise ship. <laughs> oh man, oh and we all know where it's heading to and just watching it. Yep. Politely though, I never would have gotten involved in the project if it was just a happy little fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, right? <laughs> my goal, my goal is to make people cry. That's that's the including thing. myself. It's like, if the story had stopped there, no one ever would have read it. Well, like obviously somebody would have read it, but like it wouldn't have so much more of an impact. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this interesting kind of like, people are like, why is it so sad? And then they're also like, why am I still here? Yeah. <laughs> Marauders fandom, I'm like, I don't know. really, yeah. really, they, re they really like it sad. They really like sadness. I, you get a ton of, Supernatural's a massive behemoth of a fandom, but you get a lot of pushback for people who are like, oh, I'll never read Twist and Shout because it's major character death they like will get really offended like why is that the most popular one i was like maybe just because it's good you sensitive people listen well <laughs> but that's kind of interesting about the marauders fandom too because i would have like i kind of assumed i don't know that like we we like they die like they all die <laughs> like that's the characters like that's where they come yeah. from and like, but people, when I started, well, and all through writing choices, like, we're very like, wh like, why? And I'm like, that's the story. 
<laughs> they were like, but, but I thought it was going to be different. And I'm like, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> we told you this from the start. Like, <laughs> That's you knew. The story. You knew. <laughs> On the back of that, can I interrupt and ask my question? You want to <laughs> ask it right now, out of order? <laughs> it makes sense. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Okay, so I wasn't sure if I should include this on the document, so you may not have seen this. Nor has Haley, probably. But one of arguably one of the most impactful scenes for me and I think a lot of people was the end of chapter 53 like you know when everything happens that finality moment um and one of the things that stood out for me about your writing that I really connected with that I loved was how just descriptive I mean it's made Sarah Lena's job a whole lot more difficult as a narrator but but how beautifully descriptive and in depth you go it really just always touched me the whole way throughout. And so, you know, reading chapter 53, you know, we all knew what was going to happen at the end of that chapter, like we were preparing for it. Um, and I found it really impactful myself. And so, but I wanted to ask you basically what, you know, purely out of curiosity, what do you remember what your line of thinking was from, you know, moving away from the kind of generally accepted canon moment of like you know that regular drowning being dragged down by the inferi like that sort of aspect and because i fully went into that chapter like expecting a very descriptive very graphic depiction of that scene um and that was kind of almost the exact opposite of what we got um and i was i genuinely just was very curious as to what was your line of thinking behind that um and what made you make that decision um i think it was two things one is that I liked the idea of having this character who we've seen have so little control over anything that happens to him have this moment at the end where he does somehow like take control of the situation. He makes a choice. He, um, yeah, like I, I liked, I liked not Rob, I liked giving him that moment, I guess. Like, like having him make a decision felt powerful to me. And then the other bit was that, you know, that, like, him being dragged under the water and, like, drowning and, like, you know, the, like, the horrific images of that. I felt like we're going to take so much away from everything that happens in that chapter and everything that happens leading up to that moment it, that it would all be overshadowed by just this like this scene of horror and i just like i didn't want that like that was not the point of this i you know one of the criticisms of choices a lot is this idea of like tragedy porn and like uh, yeah i i've <laughs> That wasn't really what I was trying to do. Like, that, that was never my goal. And this is one of those moments where it just felt to me like it, it, what I wanted to communicate, the, tr the, the emotion had already been communicated. And so having this, like, horrific scene was not going to, to in any way further, like, his character or his arc or the story's arc. It would just kind of be there for, I guess, like, shock value, like, very HBO, yeah. <laughs> like, you know? And I was like, I don't, I don't want, I, like, I don't want to write it. <laughs> I, I'm already sure. on. <laughs> Personally, I think it had, the way that you wrote it had so much more of an impact and more of a shock value and was so much more meaningful than any, like, long description could have, purely because of, like, what you were saying, um, what you were just touching on what you were saying as well, because it was that taking it back but also because it was so sudden and because it was kind of not what not what we had come to expect from it and it just <laughs> happened um yeah I can say I've in my whole time of reading and fanfics I've cried in two fics and that moment when that happened was one of them and it was just so sudden um and I think that had so much more of an impact than yeah, any very long description could have ever. Even though I'm sure you would have done that, that scene justice if you had have chosen that. Um, yeah, I think that the way it was depicted was... 
I don't have words, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Nathara, can I ask what the other um, fic that you cried at was, just out of curiosity? Art heist. Oh, I for, knew it. <laughs> for, no. For, I knew it. <laughs> for very specific reasons, though, that I have found out since were not the author's intentions. It was oh. just me. It was just me self-projecting. Interesting. Um, so, so I'll hop back to you real quick. Um, just overall, like hearing, um, listening to the story, is it is it weird to hear your writing being told by someone else, like the narration through Sarah Lena and just like the different characters' lines? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like it's hard to describe well like in some ways it's very uh it's like it's really nice because i've never gone to uh like read the story <laughs> does that make sense like i can i can read the story <laughs> but it's it's my voice and it's my words so like i'm always kind of like editing it and i'm always kind of not exactly like yeah um and so having it be somebody else's voice like other voices it's like it allows me to like listen to the story for the first time and so like that was super that was super fun um so i think it stopped feeling like my writing if that makes sense <laughs> It was very cool, actually. Like, like, I was like, oh, like, this is so fun. <laughs> it's interesting because on my writing, I usually use, um, so I still upload to fanfiction.net because it has accessibility features like um, dyslexic open font and um, auto reading comes as part of the app. So when you put your fix up in there, it can just like, you can play them. And I specifically use this for my own personal reasons to upload a fic that I'm still struggling on and then listen to it back. Um, until I found a way to do that with AO3 was downloading an auto reader. So it's funny because I've actually not sat and read choices through. I've listened to it through twice. Um, and that was how I, that's how it also helps with like picturing what's going on and what I'm imagining. And I do it a lot when I'm driving, when I had a really long car ride, actually, I drove up to North Dakota on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, and that is when I listened to the bulk of what was available of the fic at the time. <laughs> um, but then whenever I'm telling everyone, like, yeah, I'm listening to it way before we even started recording, they were like, uh, how? <laughs> but I I think it's it's the reason I love it so much is partially why I want it to be more, more palatable, because not everybody likes listening to the robotic auto voices. Yeah. Um, I find I can get used to them very quickly, but like I really, I really like that aspect being able to listen to it. And obviously, I wasn't going to attempt filming this. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I can't, I cannot imagine that would have been a whole other thing. Once you even add in just like costumes and props alone and settings, I was like, no, it's crazy. Well, that's like any. Sorry, this is off topic, but it's like any of the fan film like stuff. I'm always like, like how? There's <laughs> so many going on. Bank rolling this. Too, and um, we have two people in our cast that are in Order Rising, which is also dropping their first episode today, but was originally supposed to film out in Washington. And then they had to scale back when they didn't fund enough, so they did like um, video call recording. So um, Mick, who's playing James, is Regulus in Order Rising. Regulus. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, our Cersei, who hasn't aired yet, obviously, and hasn't been revealed, is playing Marlene in Order Rising. So that was a funny part of finding out who had auditioned. I was like, you guys are on other fan projects. I mean, that makes sense, but also like kudos to them. Like, again, like I can't, like it's so, that's so stressful. And I, I just don't know how you could ever raise enough. Like, I, like, yeah, it's, just, it's so much work. There's so much stuff that has to happen. Anyway, do you want to um, do the next question either Haley or Nathara? I don't know who marked what colors on what. I think mine are green, so whoever is purple, go for it. <laughs> well, that would be me then. Which is just, this is just a general question if this comes up at any point, if you have any questions for me about the process or anything that you were curious about, um, I can answer any of those. 
Um, it is a lot of organization, but... <laughs> I I think I was... Now I can't remember if you, like, just answered... Like, how did you do the... Rec like, did you record it chapter by chapter? Did you go chronologically? How... Were you in group calls like this? Like, how did it happen? So, yes, I required... So there's two ways I could have done this. Could have assigned people stuff to do, and they get it done and they turn it in. Um, but I went for a more cohesive cast feel from my experience as a director. That's one, way more fun, and two, allows me a lot more control in the moment to make sure we're getting things said correctly, accents are being monitored, because most of the cast is American. I really don't know how it works out like that. We've also got a lot of Australians and a few people from the UK, but, like, mostly American. Um, and so what we did is we broke each chapter up into scenes. Um, in of the first episode, chapter two, I think, has ten scenes, and it's all based on when, like, a scene literally in a chapter ends and you transition to another portion. Like, there's a time skip, or there's very obviously, like, now there's different characters involved. So we broke them up like that got everybody's schedules. Everybody's required to have their schedules um, three weeks in advance so that we can release schedules two weeks in advance to coordinate with the crazy amount of time zones. Um, my calendar looks insane. I'm not the one yes. doing it. <laughs> it's a disaster. It looks <laughs> crazy. Um, <clears throat> and from that, we got everybody into one place for the most part. So um, some of the funniest ones are when we had our first Quidditch sessions. One of them was at like, 1 a.m. the first one it was like at one in the morning uh, my time and then for the two brits so both um mary and marlene <clears throat> are in england it was like 7 a.m for them <laughs> so there's been a lot of jokes about frank scheduling crazy quidditch practice yeah it's that's the right energy <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> but then based on people's schedules we did not film in order because we filmed based on who was available yeah. when and what scenes we did um, we get to, for the most part, do all the Jegulus scenes in order, except for how we've had to re-record episode one five times for me. <laughs> and um, Nathara was not there for most of those. We've actually, because Nathara's in Australia, we paired up um, our Remus, Zach, with Mick, because he's always available to record. So, ironically, a lot of the Jegulus scenes actually have some moon chaser energy on James's side. That's so funny. Um... Which is a, a hidden behind the scenes fact of how that ended up working out. Um, but for Jagulus, we get to do an order. We usually, like, we do private sessions. We, on the Discord, <laughs> on the Discord, we have a channel called Mouth Noises that is specifically for the spicy stuff. Oh my god, yeah, I don't know. I would, I would die. i die even writing it. I don't know how to act it. <laughs> We've it's, had it's some fun it's, um, times, um, especially. I kid you. I think I think my first ever call, other than like the callbacks and auditions, I think my first ever like actual like call or like interaction with Seralina and it was Zach who's playing our Remus was legitimately Seralina having the realization that like, what the heck? How are we gonna do these? these scenes? And then Seralina like put post this to the cast chat, and I started freaking out because because I, I was like. I've already been cast. I haven't even <laughs> thought of this. That I'm gonna have to do this. Yeah. And so we cast it as like you know, mouth noises. Like, what noises do we have to make? Like, What's the level? What extent do we have to go to? Like, Heavy breathing. Do we have to? Is there? There was a joke about is someone just gonna record a makeout session and we're using that audio? And we were like, pretty quickly, I was like, no, no, nobody wants to listen to that. Nobody wants to listen to that. Let's let's not do that. I think that was, yeah. Um, so then it became all me. So for the most part, um, the chunks of narration that get taken out are the things that can be acted out. But then anything that became too borderline of a mouth noise <laughs> went right back to me to read. Um, yeah. Which is fine, because I record on my own, so I don't have to uh, do the fun things of sitting there and embarrassing the others as we have fun. And figuring out figuring out what different kinds oh, of yeah. sighs sound like. Oh yeah, different yeah. kinds of sighs, different types of oh groans. My God, yeah. That was the wrong groan. That happens a lot. Like you're supposed to be like frustrated <laughs> yeah. and then this one That's is like so true. Um which is funny once again because we have like a public recording channel in the VC where people can tune in and watch us. So we had to have the backup one for where we have to take like the higher triggering stuff, but mainly for the mouth noises. <laughs> because um, early on in this project, I allowed uh, 
kids as young as 14 to be a part of the Discord and audition for the project and be a part of project if they have guardian permission because I work with middle schoolers. I wasn't going to exclude kids from a project that is about people their age since Regulus is literally 14. And that was where the decision came from is that Regulus is 14. Um, so it was very necessary to have a separate channel considering it's not all adults. Which was funny because we ran into this yesterday of Oh man, we didn't realize that this uh, scene's a little spicy. We're gonna have to move over because we forgot. Honestly, same. <laughs> Sometimes I'll read bits and I'm like, what? She wrote, I wrote what? <laughs> it was such a good sign. Yeah, specifically, <laughs> specifically yesterday it was the, um, where they snuck into the Slytherin dorms and did the prank and they're in the bathroom Bathroom. together on the bathroom counter and i was like we have to move we have to finish evan and barty's shit and we gotta go (laughs) um and at first i was like oh and it's fine there's nobody under 18 in the recording channel but i was like and then our our peter pettigrew is 17 ty is and and they came in and i was like oh just kidding we we just can't chance that a kid's gonna pop in here in the middle of this (laughs) we we gotta go um even funnier is some of our cast um only read their lines and the descriptions of them and don't read the narration is like preparation. (laughs) Awesome. So did you, in regards to like the writing process, were there any points, obviously like it gained a lot of traction, um, but were there any points that you kind of thought about giving up or like not necessarily giving up, but like if you like writer's block, that sort of thing. And if you did, like what, what kind of kept you going? What kind of got you through that? I didn't have, like, writer's block, um, but I definitely, like, there's a very specific moment in which, like, it's, it was, like, chapter 49 and chapter 50, where the fic had gotten, like, very popular, and chapter 49 was such a, that's the, like, Remus chapter, Remus going to the werewolves. Is it Looper Uh, Call? Yeah, yeah, Looper Cow. And in the server, that's widely known as my favorite chapter because it could stand well, on its own. So so this is the thing, right? Like, so at this point, people were already kind of irritated with me because there wasn't a lot of Jegulus in the fic at that moment. And they were kind of like, where's the Jegulus? Like, we want more Jegulus. And then <laughs> And I was like, guys, it's a story. Like, like they can't just be together all the time. Like things have to Kevin. happen. <laughs> yeah, sorry. also canon. Like, canon compliant. Like, it's like, anyways. Um, but so, like, I already had that, and then I was like, oh my god, like, now I have this chapter where, like, not only is there no Jegulus, but I just, like, took Remus basically out of Harry Potter and, like, threw him for, like, 60, 70 pages, because it was so goddamn long. And, and there's all these original characters, and I was like, this is... Like, and so it took me forever to write it. And then I finished writing it. And I was like, no one wants to read this. No one will want to read this. This isn't what anybody wants. Like, I just like, I just like, and I was like, but I can't write. Like, what else am I going to write? This is what it is. This is the only, I, anyway. So I was like having that whole panic. So eventually I posted that chapter and then people loved that chapter. And then you're like, that should have helped, right? It didn't. It made it worse because then the next chapter, I was like, I'll never live up to that chapter. This chapter is nothing like that chapter. This chapter is like all the other chapters. Everyone's going to be disappointed by this chapter. And I remember like chapter 50 lying literally on my kitchen floor being like, this isn't fun and I don't want to do this. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Like it just felt like having so much attention while you're in the middle of writing something, like it was like too, like it was like too much pressure like it was like I couldn't like nothing I was just I just was like I don't know what I'm doing anymore like I and and I I don't have enough time I don't I don't have enough time to read things I don't have enough time to edit things like I don't know anyway so like that was for some reason it was like it was all of the stress I had leading up to chapter 49 and then something about afterwards being like well that's it everyone will hate everything now because it's not like that but I was just like yeah (laughs) I was like I don't want to do this And then I kept doing it because I also wanted the end. (laughs) Like, you know, like I also wanted the story to, yeah. (laughs) Like I'm also a fan. Like I want, I wanted it to exist and I wanted it to, to be 
there. So I, yeah, so I kept going. Yeah, I wanted it to be complete. We got so far. Like at that point, you're so close. I was like, come on. <laughs> yeah, at this point, so I've talked about Looper Call a lot because I like it so much in terms of how specifically that could slot into canon and be absolutely true. And it brings home a lot of points. Um, one of which just being that why were there no other werewolves at Hogwarts is a very, very good question to raise, knowing that we knew that there was more than just two. You know, it wasn't just um, Greyback and Remus, like there was more. So where were they and why weren't they there? Um, and uh, I've been talking about it and it's funny because I, I, I did a statistics gathering on the cast and one of the questions I asked that I didn't publicize was how many of you have read this story before coming to this fic? How many of you still haven't um, read what's coming but are walking into this? Um, it's interesting how many of them are so willing to not know what's coming. But it's um, more than 50% had not read it, not heard of it, and like still haven't read it. Uh, they are screwed. <laughs> In the best way, sorry. Like We keep warning them, like, maybe you should prepare yourselves. And they're like, nah, I'll just, I'll just read, read my parts in the scripts. Uh, <laughs> so they've heard me... Um, specifically our Remus, Zach, he's heard me talk about Looper Call over and over again and like how important it is to um, the idea of how that slots into canon so well. Well, and I liked Looper Call, but then I also got pushed back because the thing that's weird about the Marauders fandom is you have canon and then you have all the young dudes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, the Marauders yeah. canon. Yeah. And people get mad. Like, people got mad at that chapter because, well, or about Remus in general is that like it's not following all of the young dudes. They're like That's not what happens and Lyle is dead and this isn't and I'm like guys like I This is it's a different story, but it's interesting like Phantom is like a very interesting space <laughs> But I think that's one of the I was gonna say you go <laughs> <laughs> I left reading all the young dudes I specifically made a point of finishing reading it over Halloween last year, which was the 40th anniversary because of the fictional death, um, and got through it and ended up feeling like I was robbed of how sad it could have been. Like it wasn't sad enough. Um, so then choices came along and I was like, that's the vibes. That's the warrior vibes. Because like all the young dudes, school years, fantastic. I really like it. And then it was just like, because that author was, and they don't interact with the fandom at all anymore, and they don't want any interpretations of all the young dudes out there or anything like that. But um, they purposefully never wrote any scenes that happened in canon, like skipped over them. So I was like waiting on like edge of my seat to get to Remus teaching and knowing Sirius is out there and all the angst of that entire year, whole thing skipped. Just, and I was just left there being like, hold on now, I ordered pain, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I it was delivered like... with the OC they created that everyone's obsessed with, Grant Chapman. Yeah, yeah. Grant! <laughs> <laughs> that is the saddest part of all the young dudes is his, what is it called, like, Blue Skies or something, that one-shot sequel yeah. that's just about yeah, Grant. Yeah. That was the saddest part of all the young dudes to me. I did not cry reading anything of all the young dudes until then, and I barely cried during that. And to me, that's a mark of a good fic. I've cried it more than Nathara has, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like all the young dudes is like an a like slow ache pain. Like it's like it's like the pain of like lost time, right? Like that's the yeah. real because that's the Remus Lupin Yeah. tragedy is is He lived. He lived. For yeah. so long. And so long. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? But like also true. Comparatively. Like Comparatively. It's, it's that like nostalgic pain that like that's that's the like dull ache pain of of all the young dudes. Whereas like choices is a little bit more like choices like is like your heart out consistently. Yeah. <laughs> choices I love them. I I love having. I actually we had our first. It might have been one of the first scenes that we recorded like earlier today for me. It was today for me at least. And it was one of the first. I think one of the first out outside of the first episode. It was one of the first scenes that was a jugular scene that was like happy that ended on a happy note because <laughs> all of them will be like happy scenes that like you know something happens and regulus like you know slots in a one-liner yeah and like and like and and just makes it depressing 
or like the like you know the even the waterfall scene which I I absolutely loved. You know, he's got his French, like, you know, you read it and then you read the translations of the French and you're like, wow, this is actually really sad. Um, I, but I think today was the first scene that we did the that we did that actually ended on a happy note. And I was like, wait, this is the end of the scene? Like, hang on, do we not have more lines? Like, what? Isn't he going <laughs> to remind us that we're all going to die? Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's all pointless. Everything is terrible. Where, where, where are the sads? Like, come on. All right. The next chunk is all... All Haley, you, you've stolen all these questions, but I'm excited. It is. I, <laughs> listen, it was like I was sitting in a in a coffee shop and it was so cute. And I like was sitting down to like write these questions and then I like didn't stop writing them. And I was like in a trance with like an iced chai and it was just all the questions in the world. Um, um, so I do want to talk about um, just kind of like choices overall. Um, and I love some stats. So... Um, at the moment, Choices has over 1 million hits on AO3, which makes it like the 12th most viewed Harry Potter work on all of AO3 of over like 39,000 works. And then in the Regulus Black James Potter, like Jegulus tag, it's number one, and then number two in Wolfstar and number three in Jilly. So with these, um, stats in mind i guess i think it's like safe to say that you've kind of like created a lot of what we know um with this like specific relationship in these characters so kind of like what does it mean to you to have done that and be like a leader in that kind of transformative work for like the marauders fandom and jagulus as a whole um what um that was a lot i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, well, like, part of me, like, I, I try to, like, I do worry a little bit about, like, anything that, like, places fan works in, like, a hierarchy, or again, like, sort of, like, back to the kind of, like, all the young dudesification, which is not, not it to say, like, that's not the, the fix fault, but, like, this, like, sort of tendency to, to want to be, like, now this is the, whatever, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the source material of the of the fandom, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting um, because before all the young dudes, it was the Shoebox Project for years, and now nobody knows what the Shoebox Project is. <laughs> well, but like fandom goes through waves, right? Like, and and this I think now is a little bit weird. This is getting off topic. I'll get back on topic. I swear. Um, but it's like with TikTok. And with uh, social media, it's like the turnover is way faster, right? Like, like shoe, shoebox project, like years, like that was years. Now it's like all the young dudes is like a year, and then it's like now it's like you know art heist baby for like you know a, f a month, like a few months, like choices for like whatever, like a, a month, and like and then we turn it over because like it's so like it's so much quicker, like uh culture the cultural zeitgeist like even here in this like smaller space it's like so much faster so you like find people who now feel nostalgic for something that happened like eight months ago is it draco yeah. talk because it, yeah, everyone's yeah. always like where's draco talk but or whatever right like they're like oh do you remember 2020 and you're like bro like you can't be you can't be sad so fast like, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um it's, it's okay, funny because All the Young Dudes was actually written back in the early 20-teens and was first prominent on Tumblr and is where the fan casts with Andrew Garfield and Ben Barnes and all of that stuff came from was that whole second wave. It's just that it was rediscovered by TikTok. Same thing with like Super Hulak having a whole comeuppance again because of TikTok. It's like all of the <laughs> fandoms have like come to life again on this, in this area. It's Is also why there's dudes 2018. Yeah, but like the 20 teens when Tumblr was still like it started on Tumblr. It did not like sure. TikTok. Sure, sure, sure. So when that came into prominence was already when like um uh all of the like face claims were there and they were firmly what everybody was thinking of when all the young dudes was coming around. Right, right, right. Versus now we have the addition of like the re the I feel like the phenomenon is the regulus black phenomenon has blown up in the past past year. Wait, what's the regular black phenomena? What do you, what do you mean? 
using him as a character in fix that were like outside of like Drary fix, which are the most popular fix for all of Harry Potter on all of the sites. The idea of who Regulus was as a person and making stories more about him and Jagulus in general, that has been a huge comeuppance in the last like year and a half. It's huge. You can pinpoint some of the early, people can change the dates of when they post things on AO3, but you can pinpoint when some of the truly early Jagulus works were and it wasn't really, it was definitely more of a crack ship until the last year and now people are very, very serious. I actually like it. Right. Well, it was. It, it was the half it? thing of, like, the first Jekyllus week, low-key, like, so half of the people were like, oh my god, this is a hilarious joke, and everyone else was, like, half of the people were like, oh, this is gr- actually great. But since then, it's actually become such a thing. Yeah, like, I a- mean, it fully was a joke. Like, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, we love it now. It's very interesting, because I also draw the comparison of Jekyllus to Dreary, and that it's just Dreary the first version. <laughs> or, I always say that Dreary is Jekyllus with a happy ending, right? Yes, like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, that's the difference. Agreed. Which is also why sometimes I'm like, if you want the story to have a happy ending, you should just read Dreary. Like, like, that's, it's, it's, it's the, the same. It's the, if you want the fluff, or yeah. like the fluff angst, the hurt comfort, go to the Dreary. The only thing missing is the best friend's brother element, which is the complete wrench, and also um, the way the Marauders are, because Harry is so yes. different yeah. than his dad. Yes. But that is true. Well, and I think... Oh, sorry. You're good. I was, I was just saying, there's always, it's it's a lot harder to set Harry and all of them outside of canon. Like, take them away from magic. I've talked about that this before true. recently. Taking them away from magic is a lot harder than taking the Marauders away, because there's an element of the Marauders that existed before the war and before the tragedy. Yeah. But Harry's entire life has been tragedy, so taking tragedy. them away or making new stories to fit that often is very, very hard for writers. Or I also think that it's like what makes Harry interesting is playing around with this kind of like hero archetype and like both like like as it's happening but also specifically in fan fiction like the fallout from that like what happens when you're the hero and you save the day the now, what, yeah like what do you do now that's fascinating yeah. to explore Absolutely. those fix are fantastic for dreary fix I'm very yeah. into one posting right now that is specifically very heavy on that PTSD side of symptoms of war and um, what happens. There's a lot of them though, they're really good. Yeah, well, but then like it's the Marauders, it's not about the magic actually, it's about the found family aspect of it, right? Which doesn't have to be the Wizarding World, it can be anywhere. Anywhere. Um, Okay, the original question. (laughs) (laughs) So back to the original question. so, like, I get a little bit worried about the stats. That's sort of where I was going with that. It's like, I tried, uh, like, that just, I tried not to do too much uh, comparison. But but it is because the Marauders has essentially been created by fan works. The idea that I have been able to contribute to something that I have, like, been a part of and and, like, characters that have meant so much to me like, since I was a kid, is, like, super, like, fun. Like, it's super incredible. Very, very, like, magical. Like, even, I, I, like, I remember when I started, like, writing choices and, you know, like, I just, like, you have, like, a, like, a few people who are, like, commenting and liking and it, like, there was something about being able to, like, like, I was, like, this is the closest to this imaginary world that I'll ever get. You know what I mean? Like being able to write these characters and like tell the story, it like feels again like magical, like that I'm able to interact with it in like this way. And so again, like the idea that now the story has like sort of like become part of the Marauders mythos is is very, very cool. I totally feel like, I know this is like a very minor thing as well, but even being able to take your work and play one of the characters, it's a very similar feeling. Like I know it's not even writing, but being able to portray one of the characters for people has been a very surreal experience and has meant, I know not just to me, but to so many people, Some I speak on behalf of many of my cast members, has meant so much to all of us. Um, yeah, so thank you for creating the work that we've been able to do that with. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> I have listened to all of your podcasts and I love it and it's fantastic. Um, 
but I know that you've covered, um, like on that podcast, some of the more, um, maybe like difficult topics of the fandom, some like more serious aspects of it, um, like specifically in Harry Potter. Um, and then Choices itself deals with a lot of these topics, um, like sexual abuse, drug addiction, etc. Um, so why do you feel that it's so important to like develop these themes into fan produced work and like have that in um, these kind of like spaces? So I don't know if I have a good answer for this question only in that I'm not sure how I'm not sure if I I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> like I'm not sure if I I tried to tell these stories in as in a way that was complex because these situations f feel very messy to me in real life and i think a lot of the time when those narratives are portrayed in in fiction in film or in literature we like very clean narratives we want a uh, very obvious like right and wrong answers and we want the people who do the wrong things to be punished and the people who do the right things to to be rewarded and i think that in real life so many of these moments when you're in them it's so much harder to see all of that and so with these characters with their points of view what i wanted to do was sort of muddy those those narratives because i i do think that that's important because it should ideally allow us to empathize more with people who I think in traditional narratives are maybe villainized. But specifically in fan spaces, where so much of the discourse is taking place online and anonymously, and or, you know, on TikTok where, where things are, are limited, just by the fact that it's a 30 second video or like whatever, a 25 character comment. I really don't think that that's the best space to discuss trauma. <laughs> and so that aspect of it, I felt very, uh, that was very hard for me to, cause like this, the story is so long, right? Like I, I took, I tried, I, I, which is not to say that I did everything well, I, I didn't. And I think that there's lots of places for criticism. Um, but I tried to really play these things out and and then to watch them be like truncated into like a sentence and someone would be like this was done and you're like whoa 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 that situation was way more complicated than that like there were so many other factors and there was so much else that I was trying to do so I think that it's important to tell these stories because I think that that the power of storytelling is that it allows us to see things from other people's points of view and it allows us to experience things that we maybe haven't experienced in our own lives and like I said I think that ideally that that is able to make us be more empathetic to other people and like again in an ideal world like kinder or more understanding that doesn't mean necessarily forgiving but just understanding um I think that that fandom is not necessarily understanding all of the time. <laughs> that this space, this online space, is not necessarily the best place for this conversation. And I don't really know how to like bridge my my feelings with the gap between those two feelings. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for a part of acknowledging this is that a lot of the fandom currently is very, very young and doesn't know how to have these conversations. And that even if things aren't done in a perfect way, you can't expect that to be because all of this, all works of art are supposed to be a reflection of life in some way. And <clears throat> I've seen, I've seen some of the criticisms online that you're talking about that simplify things into a single sentence and don't take into account um, the picture as a whole or are able to take away what they know of something without even actually diving into what it all means. And part of the taking on of this project with those heavy themes and auditioning people and things I literally told everyone on auditions was that the goal was not to just like put it out there but to leave the discourse open have a space for it in the discord to actually talk about things um, and have a lot of links to um, what's out there for support for people recognizing their positions of 
like not necessarily like unfortunate circumstance, but that was the first thing that came to mind, but like not realizing you're in these situations. And one of my biggest gripes and um, hates on Joanne, besides the obvious uh, with her transphobia, <laughs> is that she wrote seven novels about a kid who was abused for his entire life and never told that kid how to get out of that situation and also never let him find a way out and also thought it was his fault. He had to, like, when Umbridge started also abusing him, just hit it. And the only person who ever showed concern was Hermione. And he's manipulated by adults his entire life. And that was never, never addressed. Never in any way that there should have been, especially for the kids reading this book in situations like this, thinking that it was normal and not given that out or given that chance to see that this was not normal. <clears throat> like, absolutely. And I think that the other... The other really insidious part of Harry Potter, and maybe in general, the kind of like kid hero narrative, is that all of the adults in that story know that that abuse is going on and basically co sign it. Like, they're just like, that's fine. Like, nobody loves it. No one's like, oh, we're so glad that they're treating you terribly, but they don't do any, they don't act like it's horrible. You know what I mean? Like, and that. I, like, that does really, like, it's such a weird narrative. So because, like, specifically, like, this is an audio project, I think that um, hearing some of these experiences told um, can become more real for people. Um, so how would you say that, um, like, listeners should prepare for something like this? Like, any specific advice, I guess? I mean, that's kind of hard, too, because it mostly is like a, it has to come down to you knowing what you can and cannot handle. Because I, I like, I do think that there are parts of this story that, like, I don't know if I can listen to. <laughs> like, it gets very intense, and I, like, well, yeah, it gets very intense, and <laughs> that just feels like an understatement, but, <laughs> um, um, and I do think there is something different about like hearing like hearing it in in people's voices versus just reading it. Um, and so I guess just being aware of that, that just because you were able to read it does not mean it's not going to affect you more listening to it. And so go in prepared to maybe have to stop or like take time um, or like go in, you know, checking in with yourself. I find that that's like kind of a big thing as well that you, you're like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then I'll tell you like, oh no, <laughs> I'm not fine. <laughs> so just like taking a pause and being like, am I still okay with this? Is this still, um, is this still something I'm comfortable with? Uh, because I, like I said before, I, like once you put a story in a different medium, it, it's a different experience. So just be prepared for it to affect you differently. Fair, fair. Which is something yeah. we've copiously tried to warn in what we've made of <laughs> our various warnings coming into the project, coming in as an actor. It's in all the terms the actors had to sign that they have to take care of themselves. <laughs> but I, was, I was very thorough on that bit of it. Like, be aware what you're walking yeah. into if you haven't read it. Be aware that yeah. you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, like, talk about the sex scenes, but like, these, some of these other scenes, oh my god, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I wrote them, but like, good luck, guys. Like, <laughs> those are gonna be brutal. One of the other criticisms people I see online is this um, misunderstanding of James's actions towards the end of the fic being about cheating and not about potentially a misunderstanding of what polyamorous means and what those feelings are and not having a proper word to describe it. Um, and that he struggles throughout the entire story with loving both Regulus and Lillian. That's never, it's never really portrayed that the idea was that he couldn't control himself. So I think our question on that was like, what are your thoughts on this? And um, why was this aspect of the story important for you to portray? So I feel like this discussion around James always gets a little convoluted because it kind of has a tendency to happen in two parts. Like, someone will be like, who does James love more? People really want to know who James loves more. 
They're like, but in a percentage. And I'm like, literally, how? Most. Like, how do you do that? Do you walk around with the people in your lives? So you're like, I love you 50%, but you 75%. Like, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, and so like, it, it usually starts that way where it's like, no, there is no more. There is just both of them. He loves both of them. He's in love with both of them. It's like, obviously they're different relationships. They're different people, but that there's not like, there's not a more like they're just, that's just, there's not a more. Um, and then it's like, like he loves them both. But, but, cause like he, he, James, there's the issue of like polyamory is both seen as a personal identity and a relationship structure. So James, the individual is polyamorous in that he feels these equally strong, like emotional connections with multiple people at the same time. Um, at no point is James in a polyamorous relationship though. So yeah, when he kisses Regulus, he is cheating on, on Lily, which is not good. It's not good. I, at no point. It's, but a, like, choice. it's a choice. <laughs> it's a choice. Sorry. It's a choice. It's a choice. You know, but, but I also think like, like, like context, like, like he he kisses he kisses Regulus and then he stops and he's like hey this isn't fair to you this isn't fair to her like we need to like slow this down and like nothing is done it's all very clunky because like you said like he doesn't have the language he doesn't know what he's doing that was another question I got a lot about like when he asks Regulus to come with him they're like well what's James's plan and I'm like plan he doesn't have a plan it's James it's, it's James yeah. when has plan? he <laughs> when has he when? <laughs> what? ever had a plan? Like, no, he doesn't know. He's just, he, he doesn't, he doesn't think. He just feels. Like, that's it. Like, so he just is like, I'll just, I'll fix it somehow. Like, I love them both. There's got to be a way. I think he says that at some point. Like, there, this can't be for no reason. Like, like, there, like, I have to be able to make this work. And like, do I think practically he ever could? And that's, no, like, I, I don't. But, but, but it's not, like, nobody has an affair. You know what I mean? Nothing is premeditated. He's not, he's not sneaking around behind Lily's back. Like, this is a situation he gets drawn into. And he tells her about it, which he doesn't have to do. I mean, I know, it takes him, like, a hot second. But, like, he does tell her. <laughs> and they spend two years, like, working through this. And that working through does not result in Lily being like, so you loved me more. Like, it's just, like... No, but me kissing him was not me choosing him. So <laughs> this has gotten very messy, but like, I feel like it gets tangled up in that like, I'll be like James is polyamorous. And then people will be like, oh, so, so that means that this is okay. And I'll be like, that's not what I said. It's two separate issues. Um, but like, but he loves them both equally. Carrie, who I do the podcast with she made this point this one time where she was like i feel like people were expecting a very specific narrative like a a rom romance i won't say rom-com but that would be wrong <laughs> but uh but on like a cruise a, ship yeah, a rom, a rom -com <laughs> on a cruise ship um but like a a traditional romance narrative the the idea of having three people is like a kind of a classic um, situation, um, but you choose one. That's supposed to be the whole point, is that you choose one. And people were really waiting for, for James to choose someone for the choice. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. I can't look at this word ever again. Like, it'll come, no, I know. A, normal com oh, it'll come up in a normal conversation with people, and I'll be like, choices, and I'll be like, wait, no, these, <laughs> these, these aren't fanfic people. I know. These aren't fandom people. Um, <laughs> I know. Well, and then explaining the fic, it's like, it's all choices. Anyways, um, but they're waiting for him to make a choice. And I'm like, there isn't a choice. Like, there's no choice. This is not a choice situation. And, and that leaves people feeling very unsatisfied. Or like, one of the comments that I've seen that like really pisses me off is it's like, well, clearly he doesn't love either of them. Because if he can't choose one of them, he doesn't love them enough. And it's just like, 
No, but I feel like fan fiction is a place where we're supposed to be sort of critiquing and playing around with traditional story structures. And this idea that uh, like romance, like true love occurs between only two people and that those people like never feel anything for anybody else ever again in their whole lives and that's how you know that it's real is like whatever like if that's your thing go for it you have so much media that is playing right into that but like i just felt like this makes so much sense for james like of course he loves these these two people <laughs> like and why can't he like literally why can't he like everyone's like he's got to choose i says who according to whomst i can make whatever i want happen first of all but also like <laughs> <laughs> lots of people love lots of people like like he doesn't he doesn't have to he doesn't have to choose and i feel like romance narratives they don't like a romance doesn't have to end with just two people just, we've had talk in the discord about how love all love triangles should end and polyamory instead of fighting and the the oh, discord really? is very the discord's very heavy um jaggy lily and various other ships jokes <laughs> there's a lot yeah. there's a lot of multi-shipping anyway yes great answer all right here's a completely side um, one. So, was there any point in writing the story that you wanted to turn down and run the other way away from canon compliance? Any little plot bunnies that would pop up where you're like, oh, it would be so easy to just take a scoot, scoot to the side right here and then the whole story would be different. <laughs> Did you ever have yeah. any of those moments? Yeah, but not, I don't think any of the ones that like people, like not really, none of the deaths, I don't think. Except, okay, no, I'll take that back. I hate that the parents all die. It's ridiculous. And it was so hard to write that. And like not, and people were like, really? Her mom gets cancer? I'm like, I'm sorry, they all die. Like, <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, I know it's crazy. It's crazy insane that at 21, none of them have goddamn parents, but they don't. I would change that because it, it's too much. Like that feels, it feels too much. Um, but then we've got h and S people like Dumbledore and McGonagall walking around like they're fine, but that whole middle generation, where'd they go? That does like, yeah, no, it's weird. It's, it's like dumb. I mean, it's, you know, it's JKR just like plot conveniencing stuff. Um, but then when you're doing Marauder stuff, you have to deal with all of her that nonsense like so I'm like all right they're all dead um what's I think the other is that like something that my like constant pet peeve is that it's Lily Evans Potter even in like on AO3 that's how she's tagged you can't well like you can tag Lily Evans but it's not the like tag the official tag yeah and I like that drives me crazy I'm like just Lily Evans why did she change her last name <laughs> I hate it <laughs> and, um, and and Remus and Sirius, Remus and Sirius suspecting one another. I think that like that, like that's rough. It's it's not rough. <laughs> it's like it, it some distrust makes sense, but it will always be difficult to to believe that Remus could think that Sirius could betray James and like I did my best with that with the with the prank I think that's the only way that it sort of kind of makes sense but it's like that one is like real like you're like really though like I just don't like I oh, I just don't know <laughs> I just don't know how anyone believed that Sirius did this <laughs> Remus did. Remus did. Just doubted his perception of reality. Um, yeah. And Dumbledore. Just blame Dumbledore is usually what I do. Yeah, well, exactly. It. Um, it's funny because uh, that was not at all where I thought you would take that question, but it makes sense. All of those I'm answers sorry. make sense. No, no, I liked that. I didn't know what I was going to get with that. That was great. It's funny because uh, people often are like, uh, when they do this, it's like... Um, just like when you watch a show, you're like, oh, but this one moment could have gone differently, and now you get your whole fanfiction ending right. but my favorite one that i think about all the time is if um regulus had gone with the night they attacked fleamont potter 
Oh, yeah. And um, how that might have happened differently. <laughs> you know what? He he did originally. <laughs> Please to tell. Please tell. Like, um, um, hello? I, don't, <laughs> I don't really have that much to tell. Um, but he was originally going to go. Um, and that was going to be like kind of a whole thing. But then I couldn't figure out. I just didn't need it. <laughs> like, like James didn't need more reasons to like fucking <laughs> be upset. <laughs> so <laughs> I was, it was, it got left. But originally that was what I was setting up. It was that he was going to go and there was going to be, I wasn't sure if like, I liked the idea of having Regulus and Fleamont have a moment um, because Regulus and Euphemia have a, or I say her name wrong, Euphemia. Um, they have some moments. And so like, that was kind of also what I was like, Oh, will it be like one of those moments where like Regulus kind of does like the good thing while doing the wrong thing? Like he like sort of like saves. Anyways, it didn't happen, obviously. <laughs> that was, it's funny that you did think of it like that. Cause that was exactly where I was like, what would have happened if Regulus felt guilty and then took Flamont home and suddenly he's at the Potters? Like how much worse of a choice is it to leave at that point when the relationship's already established? I don't think that he was ever gonna do that, but it was like gonna be like he was gonna like save. He was gonna like like Fleamont was gonna like maybe get hurt, and he was gonna like help him there, like something like that. But yeah, no, I'm, I meant in my brainchild of it, where he was just like, oh, I really fucked up, and had to take Fleamont home. Um, but it's interesting that that well, there was a version of that where he was there. Rough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sarah Lena and I have had this debate specifically. We have, we have, yeah. It's my, it's my favorite one. All right, so the next portion of the questions, a few of them were filmed by the actors to ask you questions. However, I don't have the ability to pull them up right now, so we are just gonna <laughs> have to read them, and you'll get to see them later. Um, and I want to. There's a couple of these that are really fun. These are the more fun questions, I should say, for the most part. Um, so Zach, who plays Remus, asked, um, People want to know, it's me, I'm People. You wrote all of these wonderful characters and brought them to life, but I'm curious, who in the Marauders universe do you actually kin? Uh, Sirius. <laughs> um, and I think that it actually makes me bad at writing him because I understand, well, like, it's, like, twofold. One is that I understand him most of the time, so that I don't really, like, I'm, and then people are like, why would he do that? I'm like, what do you mean? It's so clear. <laughs> like, I'm not saying it, like, <laughs> it's rational or good, but, like, I, I know why he did that. Um, or, like, I can be, like, a little bit, like, maybe harsher with him, I guess, because I, like, relate to him, so I'm, like, I, I like write him in a way like people just seem to like they're so critical of serious as like in choices anyways and I'm always like but I totally get it I totally know exactly where he's coming from again like I'm not saying I'm like I'm not saying you should do it <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> he's not a role model but <laughs> but yeah it's definitely it's definitely serious so I did see your bookmarks on AO3, which is only because I was looking, I was like doing research, okay? It wasn't creepy. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're there. <laughs> they are. They are. And so, okay, so some of them were from All for the Game, and which I don't know if you guys certainly know, if you don't know what it is, it's a terribly written series, but it's so good. Um, <laughs> and it's about a made up sport. And, like, it's basically, um, it has a lot of trigger warnings. Like, it's super extensive. Um, but I, I, I did note that it might be in rivalry, trigger warning-wise, with Choices itself. Um, but, um, <laughs> me and, me and River both wonder if that series was at all influential to, like, the creation of the fic, since there's some, like, I would say some like just noticing some similarities between the two just in theme i think like not in any kind of well like real purposeful way right yeah and yeah, I, yeah. I also think that like maybe not in the way that is expected like not in that kind of like oh i want to traumatize everyone sort of way. <laughs> but um <laughs> 
Yeah, true, it's already there. But I do think um, that the relationship between, um, oh my God, no, Andrew and Neil, I just forgot their names. <laughs> <laughs> that was so scary. Um, um, I Like that, that, um, that was the first time that I've, and ma the only time that I've ever seen um, consent handled that way and and to that extent and that like that kind of consistently and I something that actually bothers me a lot about all for the games fan fiction is that while I think that like Nora who wrote the original series she never wavers from that like there's no point when the those two characters are interacting where that conversation of consent stops happening but fan fiction has a tendency to kind of just like skip over it they're like, and now they're in a relationship, and so we don't have to... Andrew's trauma doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> um, and so I think that that definitely did inspire the way that I wrote James and Regulus, because something that was really important to me, besides showing those, like, all of those, those conversations and the kind of negotiations, was showing that it's, like, it's not like they get together and then, like, Regulus is just... I don't know, like, doesn't have to, doesn't have to still deal with this trauma. Yeah, yeah, like, love does not fix you, like, so, and, and also, like, or, like, or, 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 like, you don't have to be fixed, like, this is not a problem, like, that was my, this, you know, that we have to find a workaround for, which is what it feels like all the for game fan fiction is trying to do, like, like, Andrew's issues, with being touched are a problem that like stand in the way of the like fluffy content that we want. And uh, so it was very important for me, um, like that, that in writing Regulus and James, that it's like, it's never a problem and it's not a, it's not like a barrier to anything. It's just like conversations, you know? But yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, on that note, uh, which of the, I guess, characters overall or one of the foxes do you think that uh, Regulus is, is most like? Okay, this is such a hard question. <laughs> um, and I don't know what the answer is. Like, I want to say it's like some kind of hybrid Kevin Neal situation. Oh, like, okay. Frank is really very Kevin-esque, so I can't just say Kevin, but at the same time, I don't think that Regulus is Neil, exactly. Because Neil's too, like, self-assured. <laughs> Neil is, Neil is a, a different breed. <laughs> He's a different breed. But I think, so, like, I think that, that the, like, secretive sort of, like, keeping everything bottled in kind of aspects of... Neil and like some of the more cutthroat bits that like I don't think that Kevin has and I think come out in Regulus every once in a while he has but I think that like in his kind of like type A like nervousness disposition it's like Kevin <laughs> it's Kevin Neil <laughs> yeah yeah that's so interesting okay who do you um, think who do you think is Regulus oh god I don't know <laughs> Now that, you, now that you put it on me, now it's, now right? it's a word. It's, it's a hard one. <laughs> I, I read the series, like, pretty recently, um, which was super weird since it's, like, a relatively older, like, Tumblr fandom. Yeah. Um, that's, like, early, early 20... That's, like, 20, 2014, something like that. But, um, I don't know. I would agree about Neil. I would... I would say that he probably, like, I feel like Regulus has a little bit of Andrew in him, just like what we were talking about with, um, just like how he approaches, like, um, consent and, like, mm -hmm. some of his, his, his background there. But I don't think, I, I feel like Regulus tries to be the bad boy image that Andrew is, but he'll never get there. Like, he, he, like, I feel like he thinks that he's like that, but he's not. Oh, interesting. I, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like Andrew tries to, or Andrew is sort of that, like, rebel with a cause type of personality. Mm -hmm. See, I feel like Regulus isn't trying to be, like, that's, Sirius is, like, the one who's like, I am the rebel. That's true. And he is That's true. Like, he that's is not. That's true, yeah. But, 
Or like he is sort of, but like a little bit not. But like, um, but like I feel like Regulus, I don't know. But I don't know if he fits any of those characters like exactly. Cause I, I the first thing I thought of was Andrew, but then I was like, uh, he, he also feels too like self-assured. <laughs> yeah. Also, did you say that Frank was like Kevin? Yeah. They're like- I, w I would give Frank Matt Boyd, but that's only because Matt Boyd is my favorite character. <laughs> well, Matt Boyd is James. Matt Boyd is totally oh. James. Sorry, we're on a whole tangent that I don't really understand, but it's super interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. I love Matt. He's like my, he's yes. my favorite character. Yeah, but he's very yes. golden retriever energy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so this was, I know this was River's part of the question, but was there any other, um, novels or media other than like Harry Potter or Song of Achilles that influenced choices or how you like tackled specific topics um, in the story? Um, I don't, I mean, I'm sure that there were, um, but not like consciously. Like I can't think right. of anything that I was specifically drawing from, I think. I'm trying to make sure that that's not a lie, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't think that it is. So Anthony, who plays Sirius Black, um, had a bit of a question about Sirius. Um, so he said, um, so my question pertains to the character of Sirius to help understand the character better. Uh, my question is, what exactly is the extent of the psychological trauma that he's endured? So throughout the story, he has issues with his family. Um, so I'm just wondering, since I haven't been able to ascertain the full extent of it yet, uh, what exactly was done to him? what was planned for him, what did his family want, and what were their expectations? And uh, finally, does he ever get any kind of absolution or cathartic moment with any of them? It's such a like hard question. That's almost like a story, like he, he'd have to write that story in and of itself. I think that the big things with, with Regulus and Sirius is the amount that they have to withdraw within themselves to survive in that household and the ways that they create like people to protect them like like full personas right so so Sirius has his like big flashy showman I don't give a shit about anything you know like person that he builds to to put in front of himself and um, um, and the rest of the world. And Regulus has kind of the complete opposite of that, is this very, like, uptight, reserved person. And, and they create these personas to, to literally put something between themselves and the house that they're in. Um, because they don't have anybody to protect them. There's a lot of him being left alone. There's a lot of isolation. There's a lot of feeling like he's he's by himself in this. And I think that he comes to resent Regulus a lot for that because he feels like Reg got somebody. Like, like Sirius had nobody and Regulus had him. And so how is it that Regulus is the one who, who can't, can't get out of this? Or how is it that Regulus is the one walking around acting as though like he was the most hurt when Sirius feels like he was the person who was left the most alone. Um, and so there's references to him being locked alone in his room. And I think there's also like that kind of like the, the really fucked up sort of like mind um, legitimacy that happens where, where even, even their thoughts are not private and are not safe. And so like when I say that they have to retreat, they like, have to like retreat. I mean, uh, Regulus talks about it and this thing that, that Sirius taught him to, to take all of your feelings and all of your real thoughts and you put them in this box and you bury it somewhere. And the problem for both of them is that sometimes they, they can't get that back, that, that they go so far within themselves that they lose themselves. I mean, that's the prank sort of is that, that Sirius is able to so easily compartmentalize um, in a way that that most people don't because if he couldn't compartmentalize, he would have lost it. <laughs> Same with Regulus. Again, this is such a this is such an all over the place tangent, but but I think that that's for me is the biggest 
most important part of <laughs> the trauma that they face is is their ability to compartmentalize, is their ability to create sort of these alternate versions of themselves to protect them. Um, and like, and, and this feeling that, that you have, like absolutely nothing is safe. Like their, their heads, their thoughts are not a safe place to be, um, which is a very distressing <laughs> way to live your life. It was it was a big question. He's also one of the people who hasn't read the fic and is only reading it as, as the scenes come. One of my favorite like moments in the entire story is um, when James and Lily come up with Harry's name. Um, so uh, Harry James is literally the the artist of the song. It's been a long, long time, which I feel like a lot of people know from um, the Captain America movies. But um, can you? like, I don't know, explain or walk us through like that process of how you came up with or decided to like use that way of them like coming up with his name. Cause it's kind of like a perfect um, connection between the two. So what sort of made you decide to like, good. <laughs> I do feel that way because I was like, I wanted them to have like a moment that's like, a, you know, it's a very hard chapter and their relationship is very tense through most of it. And I wanted there to be especially around sort of like Harry and stuff like these kind of softer moments and like literally I was sat here and I was like how can I make Harry a sentimental moment like there's just no like Harry the name is not a it's there's nothing about like that's like it's such a boring name it's no offense to <laughs> no offense to anyone named Harry but like it's just like not like a name like it was just like and then they came up with Harry <laughs> To like really um and and the other thing that really bothered me not to go back to the like last name thing but it's like harry james potter is so all about james like it's his grandfather it's whose name was harold it's james and then it's his last name and lily is like nowhere in there and i was like oh like i can't change his name because <laughs> harry potter is harry potter but like, I need there to be some element of Lily in here. So, you know, she has her records and they've been mentioned like a couple times and her dad. And I was like, okay. So, so I started looking for artists whose names started with Harry actually. And then it was like, Harry James. And I was like, done, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> That's exactly what I want. That was, that was like one of those moments where I was reading and I literally like had to put my phone down. I was like, no, I was like, no, <laughs> like it was too good, too good. Um, you know, what's funny about that is in the same respect with Harry, the moment that made me, even on the reread, I had to take a minute and it's kind of, it's kind of funny in retrospect because it wasn't a super serious moment, but was the, while they're in the moment where James is at Grimmauld Place and everything and, um, helping Regulus and Regulus is hinting at like oh you're having a baby that's really dangerous and James is like why are you freaking out it's a baby not a weapon and I was like I'm gonna need to go take five days to recover <laughs> on this statement yeah <laughs> yeah literally anything about Harry is automatically depressing like anything they say <laughs> like even Regulus like being like oh this kid's gonna be so loved you're like ha 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 <laughs> yeah oh, those oh, that's funny <laughs> If all of the choices characters were Animagi, who would be the most disastrous slash inconvenient form and what would it be? So this is probably obviously excluding the main four. It would be Evan Rosier, but I don't know what he would be. <laughs> that's, that's, that's as far as I've got. Evan would be the most disastrous, but like in what form? Oh, like what's the most disastrous animal? I feel very much uh, for the bird. Like I feel like he'd be like a bird of prey. A bird of prey. I feel, like, I feel like it'd be something even more chaotic than that. Just something like massively like, inconvenient to him. So then he's gonna make it a problem for everybody else. Yeah, like it's gotta be something like loud and big and you got like a seal or some shit. Like a toucan. Like a toucan? <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, that is it. That's what it is. A toucan or like a pair, something that is like loud and bright and like in your face. Yes, oh my God, yes. That's it. Yeah, that would be that would be it. Done. I, have to admit, I came up, I came up with one the other week as a rival. This was absolutely as a joke. I don't know how he came up with this. 
but as a joke, because it as a joke for a Regulus <laughs> one instead instead of you know the classic black cat or like that sort of thing, a starfish. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it works oh, on so, so many <laughs> levels. A star, B fish, C starfish are one of the only sea creatures who can't actually swim but live in <laughs> the sea. <laughs> Is this when we started joking about the freaking um, Charlie the Unicorn like, thing too? Starfish really, really yeah. loves you. Yes. I remembered this conversation. Uh, Forget the cat, black cat agenda. <laughs> Let's watch the starfish agenda. Uh, the starfish agenda. <laughs> that would be such a useless, like... I know! She would be so stuck. <gasps> Can you imagine, like, oh, oh the helplessness is stuck? What? I mean, it- No, imagine, they're in, the, they're in the Slytherin common rooms, and you know how they have, like, the, the glass the wall? Bo- He's just there. <laughs> it's like, it's like starfish with a giant squid. It's like fly on the wall, but it's a starfish on the wall. Didn't want, didn't want to be afraid to the giant squid, but wants to go hang out. That's funny. They walk by, and they're like, huh. He seemed lonely. He was just back. Look at him. <laughs> We lost Here three. he is. For a month or two there. They move so slow. <laughs> but it's also like the idea that if he was like just on the wall, like that he was there by choice. Like he's like consciously just. <laughs> but like, how would he even do that? Like he would train. Someone would have to put him up there. <laughs> so Barty, like, I, got, I, I have to ask you a favor. <laughs> Barty and Emma are just like climbing on top of each other. <laughs> Friendship. They were like, we're not questioning this decision because it can get us killed, but we're still gonna be over here like, what the fuck, man? They're like, we support you, Reg. <laughs> Whatever you gotta do. <laughs> if you need to be a star, you be a star. So, um, you completed choices. Um, you left us all heartbroken. Half the comments on the TikTok, um, were asking for an apology video with tears. Um, and then you went, oh, I, I know how to fix this, and then released a hockey AU which is brilliant, by the way. Um, it's called Kill Your Darlings. It's fantastic. Um, it is witty, it's representative, and it has a happy ending tag, which is the best part <laughs> of all of it. So um, I guess this is sort of just to ask, like, what's 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 next? What's coming next for, for you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have Kill Your Darlings, and I have Here's Looking at You Kid, with those, which is like George and... Um, Blaze, which is actually going to end up referencing choices, which I'm pretty excited about. They're going to, they're going to, there's going to be some come and go room action. Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, so yeah, I'm alternating between those two fics right now, which is like kind of a lot. Um, I, I would like to write, I would like to write a founder's fic. I would like to write Godric and Salazar because like that kind of starts in choices and I'm like, Ugh, yes, I want it. I also have this like pirate um, Mary Lily AU that I, like, really want to- Hello? Run. <laughs> Hello? Um, yeah, so we'll see, we'll see. And then there's the Choices sequel as well, so. Yeah, which yes. I think is gonna involve a lot of the Lupercal peoples. <laughs> oh, they sound so beautiful and so painful and amazing all the time. I just want to be able to, like, destroy the laws of time and space yeah. and give you all of the time. Yeah, I know, same. <laughs> I'm always like, uh, ugh, I have so many things to write. You can take your time writing it, and then whenever that sequel happens, I'll be like, reunion, bitches, except for the dead ones. <laughs> Sucks to suck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Rude. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, my God. So many of Yeah, that's- Can't wait, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll be there to read random characters on the side. <laughs> I'll be there to read Slytherin Boy. <laughs> Yeah, Haley's been reading a lot of fun random characters on top of being Bellatrix, so it's a variety. There's so many. (laughs) Not to mention our, um, Evan is also playing Damien, is also going to play Gabe, is also playing Rodolphus. He he snagged four. So talented. So multifaceted. (laughs) We've done it. So thank you for sitting down and talking with us about choices, the Marauders Audio Project, and, and everything in between. Um... So before we let you go, um, is there anything else you want to say about like episode one for new listeners, people reading choices for the first time, or or anyone else coming into the project? Um, like again, like I think like it's very fun, and also it's 
it's a new experience of the story, right? So just because you've read it doesn't mean that there's nothing new that you couldn't get from from listening to this version of it or this production of it. I think that that's something really special. I feel like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much.